Yeah, I mean, it's, there, you can always spend more money on audio right. equipment. There's right. always better stuff out there. Oh, definitely. And uh, I was out in Boulder, Colorado years ago. It was a business trip and uh, looking at uh, a couple of amplifiers that they had there, one that I was interested in in particular, and it was a Creek amplifier. I was huh. kind of comparing it to the Rotel amplifier, you know, kind of audiophile, mid-grade. <laughs> and I heard somebody playing a saxophone in the back room and really intrigued. So I go walking back there and walk into an empty room. And there in the room are these big Martin Logan electrostatic speakers. And it just sounded like somebody there just totally live. That's it was awesome. amazing. Cool. But I've heard they've got good, really good quality. I've, they're they're I've, amazing. The electrostatics are, are unique in how they reproduce sound. Yes. Very, very cool. Um, very expensive. <laughs> 10 grand back in, this would have been in the late 1980s. But yeah. yeah, you can keep spending money. But there's a diminishing return on your investment Yeah, with oh. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I'm gonna sure. make one someday. <laughs> yeah, just for just fun. Make your own. Figure out. We need to talk about that later. About <laughs> building, building stuff because we'll I, I that. like that. Yeah, we'll get into that. So this is the uh, first of our Morphite Chat episodes. I am Sam. I'm Mark. And uh, this is our series. It's going to be a little more informal, as you can see. We're in someone's home, and we just wanted to sit down with some people that we respect and we admire, or we just want to hear from, and uh, see what they have to say. See what kind of knowledge they have about the world and uh, just kind of chat. So we called it our Morphite chat time. So we're here today with Jeff Johnson and we're gonna be talking with him about all kinds of stuff as uh, you may have heard from Lee in there. Um, I, actually, you mentioned electrostatic and I'm a little vague on what that means exactly. Uh, I'll probably uh, say more than I know real quickly, but basically <laughs> think, of a, uh, think of just a piece of ribbon yeah. that's stretched over an edge and you put an electrostatic charge on it. Okay. So there's the high, high voltage power supply and you put that charge on there, and the electrostatics are unique in that they make a very, very natural, realistic s sound stage. Mm. Amazing imaging. Mm -hmm. uh, we ought to talk about imaging later because that's just it's <laughs> yeah. it's cool how you can get that. speakers to do imaging, mm. three dimensional imaging. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, I've heard the the quality is really good on those because it, well, it, it's a different, entirely different way of making the vibrations for the sound to begin with because uh, speakers, as I understand it, are all based on the coil and magnets and they just go off of that. The repelling mm -hmm. forces with electronic impulses and that's what makes the music. That's what makes the vibration. It pushes a cone. Mm -hmm. But with a ribbon, a standing ribbon that actually is just one side's positive, one side's negative and you're just making it vibrate real fast mm -hmm. or a film or whatever it is, it's very, it's, it's a bizarre concept. It's almost mm -hmm. like a like a string, like a violin, you know, in a sense, right? Yeah, because it's yeah, vibrating. You can less. compare it to that. Yeah. The, the effect is probably similar to that. Like it's yeah, yeah. it's just an incredible concept. Somebody thought it up mm -hmm. <laughs> back in the eight. Well, probably before the eighties, but yeah, you don't get low frequency reproduction from the uh, those ribbons. Oh. So typically, you mm -hmm. will see an electrostatic speaker for your mid range on up mm -hmm. in your frequency bands, and then you'll typically couple it with a subwoofer or even just a woofer with each of the electrostatic speakers. Mm, that makes sense. All running on sure. separate power supplies and Very good system. pretty expensive setup, but just <laughs> if you've yeah. got the money, they are yeah. amazing. Yeah. You'll, you'll, you'll note I don't have any here. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, are you going to show us the, in the back room there? <laughs> Do you uh, do you do this? Do you like headphones, or do you prefer like would, if you had your choice, would you prefer a stereo, a really good stereo setup, or a good pair of headphones? I prefer um, an actual set of speakers okay, myself. Really? Yeah, okay. um, I will use headphones only when I don't want to bother other people with my right. music. Any right. other time, I'm using the speakers. Huh. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. It's kind of how our brother is, Dan. He loves, I mean, he has good headphones, but he also has a really good system or, a, you know, a number of speakers and stuff set up and he's got it set up the way he wants and it's got a receiver and amp and all that stuff. Like, yeah. yeah. Whereas me, I'll just plug in a little USB speaker thing to my monitor and I'm like, ah, oh, good enough for now. <laughs> there's sound. Yeah. There's sound, Th like there's sound there and, and all the information content is there. Right. Um, right. A funny story on that. My second son's kind of an audiophile like I am. Is he? And uh, I had a, a decent set of Bose earbuds that had pretty good, pretty good sound, pretty natural sound, good full response. I mean, most people would consider it kind of high end, mm. about a hundred bucks, something yeah. like that. Yeah. He had, the, the name is escaping me, the brand name, but he had a set of headphones and he was saying, these are way better. <laughs> I said, I said, it can't be that much better. And he yeah. says, listen, he pops them on my head and he starts playing music. I sat there for probably a, 
probably a full two minutes listening to them. I took them off and I said, you win. <laughs> they were just amazing. Yeah. They were, they were very good. Uh, it's got to be Sennheiser. Sennheiser's, yeah, those no. are, as I say on, on Reddit, I, I go yeah. on the audio file subreddit sometimes, and Sennheiser's are thrown on a lot. They make some amazing stuff. I bought a pair of uh, Koss Porta Pros, mm. and they're 50, they have been 50 bucks for the longest time. They're modeled after the same design and everything they did from, I guess, the 80s. And that was one of the first, like, you know, it's obviously like lower end of the mid, you know, great stuff, but it was the first pair of headphones I put on personally where I was like, oh, there's a difference. Like there's, yes. these aren't little, you know, earbuds that you shove in mm -hmm. your pocket, like these sound good. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's amazing how that takes the same piece of content, you know, a piece of music or something that you enjoy anyways, and then suddenly it's like, oh, like high def, you know, and it's just, mm -hmm. wow. And you realize that there's another octave to the music on right. both ends yes. right. that you didn't even know was in the music yes. content. Yes, yes, it's amazing. <laughs> I, I have used nice pairs of headphones like that before. Uh, mostly, most of my experience with that, which now, later in life, or not later, but, you know, at least m <laughs> maybe close to midway through life, I'm finding that I, I have more of an ear for music in that sense where I, I, I would mm -hmm. like to hear it in all its glory. But where I found I fell in with that stuff before was uh, video gaming. They make video game headphones that are also really, really have like way different ends of the spectrum and everything. And you can hear stuff on those. It's, it's funny to hear the difference even with that. You'll be playing a game where it has leaves and stuff in it, but you don't hear any of that on the speakers and you're just hearing everything. But like you're saying, you put them on and suddenly you're getting sound from only this ear, this channel, and you're hearing leaves over there. So you know there's a guy over there. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's bizarre. But yeah. it's really, really cool technology. Turtle Beach and a bunch of these different people have made stuff like that. Yeah. I wonder how good those are in comparison to the, the audiophile headphones, though. They're probably not as good. Uh, yeah, well, because they do, a lot of those, they do the, the um, it's like uh, 7.1, quote unquote, but like in the headphones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and which yeah. apparently is, you know, not as, I mean, it's like why, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask what... Uh, because you talk about you were looking for an amp and stuff, what got you, what got you interested in that kind of stuff as far as technology and or audio and all even, that? Yeah, audio yeah. stuff. Well, I, I guess it probably goes back to uh, my young years. I mean, my dad had a stereo. He had an old Lloyd stereo and an old Gerard turntable. Really <laughs> loved music, classical music, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, southern gospel music. And uh, he didn't have high end equipment by any means, but he got stuff that was that was you know, mid-grade stuff that had good sound to it, and I mm -hmm. learned to appreciate good music. He had bought me a little transistor radio, and I could really tell the difference between my little handheld <laughs> transistor radio listening to FM yeah. and Dad's stereo. Yeah. And so I got oh, interested in sound reproduction, yeah. and uh, when I got into my adult life, got into some projects. I had an old set of uh, Technics speakers, and uh, after doing a lot of reading about speaker design, I kind of took those things apart and sealed them all up and used damping material and just did some modifications to them. And yeah. when I got done doing just, just what the book said, basic design mm -hmm. principles, it was like, mm -hmm. wow, hmm. you're really improved, the yeah. speakers. So I tried a, I tried a uh, car stereo project next. I actually had an old Honda Accord and uh, I mounted a couple of eight inch woofers in the trunk, but mm -hmm. I'd cut out an opening in there so it would fire through the rear seats because mm, at mm -hmm. the time we didn't have uh. any kids and so we pushed that <laughs> push that low frequency stuff right through the back seats. You yeah. never saw the speakers back there but just added this all this bass content yeah. that before was not coming through the door and dash speakers mm. huh. at all. So kind of <laughs> kind of all started off that way. Uh, there was some really good materials out there and now with the internet now I mean there's so much information content out there. Right. I had books basically, largely. Right. And uh, had some spreadsheets that I had developed for doing some of the calculations, but it all comes down to following the rules, the basic engineering principles. Mm. Certainly. And mm -hmm. every acoustic project is trade-offs. You always have trade-offs. But the less trade-offs you make, the better your result. Yeah. Mm. You yeah. get better and better sound. Huh. So it's always uh, a bunch of tricks. Yeah. Were you uh, formally educated in engineering, or? Yeah, um, <laughs> from the time yeah. from the time I was in grade school, um, I wanted to be a scientist. Okay. I mean, I'm talking like first grade. I wanted to be a scientist, so I I had I was a geek from I guess the time I was born. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
that morphed in high school into wanting to go into engineering. And uh, ultimately, um, I, I did my uh, bachelor's degree in theoretical physics, math minor, got a master's in mechanical engineering design, mm. went to work uh, civil service Navy, and uh, eventually reclassified as an electronics engineer. And then back in 1990, the FAA hired me as an electronics engineer. And tech support, I mean, think of tech support for the air traffic control system. That's what I do. Mm, okay. And so we did, did acoustic projects and electrical projects, mechanical projects, civil projects, just all these things. It's fun. I mean, for me, yeah. I'm kind of an academic mutt anyway with my, <laughs> my background, and I have yeah. a short attention span, so always doing different things is great right. for me. No, I identify and, with that uh, yeah. <laughs> one of, I mean, some of them were actually acoustics. I had one in uh, uh, 1990. Uh, we had a project. We had a secure facility, and it was inspected by the uh, Army, and they said that its acoustics were inadequate for processing the information that was to be processed in there. Mm-hmm. And uh, they said we had 30 days, the, our facility had 30 days to fix the problem, hmm. or they were going to shut down that node. And uh, so it was thrown to tech support, and boss was pulling us about our backgrounds. I said, oh, yeah, I've got some acoustic background yeah. and some speaker stuff. And he says, okay, Oops. it's yours. <laughs> and so I started looking at the problem, got the uh, requirements from the Air Force, what they were wanting for this, for acoustic insertion losses. And I was like, wow. So I told my boss, I said, can I just go home this afternoon. I want to do some prototyping in, mm-hmm. my, uh, in my workshop at home mm-hmm. because we had looked at commercial equipment available for this and they had a six month lead time. Oh, wow. And yeah. we were looking at like, you know, almost $10,000 <laughs> and, and didn't have the time to do it. Yeah. And they were going to shut us down. So I ended up making this prototype, taking some measurements and then realized that if I took it full scale, I could make it. And so it was a it was a bizarre project where I bought <laughs> literally bought multiple sheets of particle board and um, pegboard okay. and um, egg crate mattress foam <laughs> and cans of rubberized car undercoating. Okay, oh, nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I built these I built these zigzaggy labyrinths, mm. and we fastened them over the intake and exhaust vents f- for the room, the air vents, mm-hmm. and. Uh, they were ugly and they were huge and they were heavy yeah. and they were on time and they worked and they passed the test and yeah. everybody was like, wow, that was yeah. amazing. You know, how did you, how did you do this? And it was like yeah. fundamental yeah. engineering principles that anybody who's willing to do some reading mm-hmm. could do. Well, that's and, the key. If you're willing to do the, re- the homework on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. That's cool. So that's kind of my, my background. I've moved on from there to my, my, Signature speakers, I call the pyramids, had them for years and years, and they're really cool. Um, Don't know how familiar you are with how they rate speakers. Typically, they will use logarithmic um, measurements. So Mm -hmm. when they talk about the roll-off on your high end and your low end, they'll talk about the 3 dB down points, your half power points where it drops off. And uh, the pyramids had a 3 dB down point of 17 hertz, which is below the human hearing range. So it would reproduce significant content that you could feel, but not hear. Yeah. And a lot of modern digital recordings actually have content down to as low as five hertz. Wow. And yeah. so it was amazing to uh, to hear those things. If you're familiar huh? with the, the old Jurassic Park movie, yeah. where you had the the T yeah. Rex going through there, and they would see the, you'd see in the movie the little glass of water yeah. vibrating. They recorded that content on CDs, and they had it available. And oh, okay. I would play that thing, and you, <laughs> you would just, it's like, I didn't hear anything, but I felt something. Yeah, yeah. It would just be like this. That's cool. And as it got closer, the floor would just kind of move up and down a little bit, and, just, <laughs> and, and the, the woofer cones would just be going. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it was cool. I had, I had fun with the pyramid projects. Um, eventually, I uh, moved on from them because they were just, they were so huge. Um, we didn't have a good place for them in this house. I had them yeah. in the previous house. I remember I told Barbara, I said, <laughs> I said they're going to be about this big and about this high. And she says, yeah, that's fine. And then I built the first one and she says, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. now we've kind of got, I built a uh, bookshelf satellite subwoofer system okay. that also does really well, does great imaging, but mm-hmm. the, the my signature was the, the pyramids. Mm-hmm. They were so you, fun. you built those completely yourself then? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Obviously, bought the drivers. I didn't, 
you know, didn't wind my own coils oh, and all okay. that. Yeah, but, oh, uh, I didn't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The cabinetry and uh, honestly, what I think what surprises a lot of people is it takes a lot of homework to select the right components mm. to yeah. put them together. Um, there are so many woofers and mid-ranges and tweeters out there. Mm -hmm. And I, so often I'll hear somebody say, oh, I burned out a, a voice coil on my woofers, so I bought two more 12-inch woofers and put them in. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh, <laughs> because it won't perform the same. Mm. It's, it's like right. saying, oh, I just bought another engine from a junkyard and I'm gonna try to put it in. Oh, okay. Well, what did you get? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a 12 inch. The old one was a 12 inch, the new one's a 12 inch. There's so many different 12 inch woofers. Huh. Some of them belong in very, very small boxes. Some of them belong in what they call an infinite baffle that has an open back like you would use yeah. in, the, in a trunk deck in a car, okay. that kind of thing. And then some of them huh. are intended for bass reflex. Um, some of them are intended for uh, PA systems, okay, okay. where well, you're not yeah. concerned with ultimate low, mm -hmm. uh, low frequency content, but being able to push really hard, mm -hmm. lots of power and lots of survivability. Mm -hmm. So you have to match that woofer to that box. Mm -hmm. So when you build a set of speakers, you don't build a box and go looking for a woofer. <laughs> you look up your Thiel small parameters you find your, your FS and your, and your VB and all your Thiel small parameters, and you design on paper what you want those speakers to be, and you build a cabinet around that woofer, yeah, okay. literally. Yeah. Yeah. Only one size will work hmm. for that woofer. Hmm. Well, and having uh, gone through a number of coils for our uh, uh, upcoming here, we're gonna have a video soon, still working on it, but um, about our Sonovox, the product that we're gonna end up trying to release here soon. And that one, um, I've had to wrap a number of coils myself for that. So I can say firsthand, there's a lot of variables. And just in wrapping a coil, yes. you gotta look up this, the all wire gauge, American wire gauge table, and find exactly the resistance, and then cut. You would have to cut exactly to get the exact right resistance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not to mention wrap it all exactly right. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, I can only imagine adding all that to a cone and then building a box around it, there's no way. I mean, <laughs> un unless you knew all the exact specifications and you built the second, you wrapped the second one yourself, there's no way you could match all that. You're, mm -hmm. you're exactly right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just from my limited experience. Like what you're talking about, even even a little mm -hmm. bit more specific. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure there's a glut now of just cheap replacement stuff you can buy from overseas or whatever on oh, yeah. Alibaba or Amazon or whatever. Mm -hmm. So like you said, it looks like the right thing, but then it's not the same. Oh, well, absolutely. And honestly, you can take a, a cheap woofer, and if you design the right box for it, you can get decent sound out of okay. it. Okay. But take a cheap woofer and slap it in the wrong size box, yeah. and it's pathetic. <laughs> it's really pathetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You mentioned uh, imaging several times. What is that about? Okay, imaging is fascinating, and it is the, um, it's the holy grail of <laughs> sound reproduction. Uh -huh. Now, these days, uh, people want to just bring a sound processor into a room, a five plus one, seven plus mm -hmm. one processor. They wanna mount speakers all over the room, front speaker bar, so they can place that stuff everywhere they want. You know, mm -hmm. vehicles coming in from behind. Mm -hmm. uh, right. To do three-dimensional sound with two speakers mm -hmm. um, is a lot more sophisticated. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. You, have to, you have to do a lot of interesting things. First of all, human ear, how do you determine where something is coming from, sound? It's all stereo, so. No, do, our voice talking. How, how do you know where I am? Determine? If you close your eyes right now, how do you determine where I'm sitting? I would assume it has to do with the shape of the ear, and then you feel the vibrations. There's some sort of microprocessor in my brain that tells <laughs> okay, me. Okay, but if you have one ear, how do you know where I am? Mm. Now that, I do not know. So, it's based on time We're difference trying. of arrival in the two ears. Right, right, right. Oh, okay, okay. That's how you determine where something's located. So in recordings, they record, not intentionally, but by virtue of recording, you record those time differences when you use stereo microphones, mm -hmm. okay? So think of adding or subtracting times for left and right channels. You can actually make something that doesn't just appear between the speakers. You can reproduce sound that is left of the left speaker hmm. or right of the mm -hmm. right speaker. Mm -hmm. Because of that. Because of that. That's but you right. have to have properly designed speakers. Typical speakers just don't do it hmm. because they have a lot of, uh, too many compromises. 
Okay. If you have a very large flat face on a speaker, you're going to smear the imaging. If you have a, an edge on the speaker, you get what's called a diffraction effect, and it'll reflect back. So a well-designed set of speakers for imaging doesn't have that tweeter right in the middle. Hmm. You offset it. So the time difference of arrival to the right edge of the speaker and the left edge of the speaker are different times. So if you get any kind of edge effect and it comes back, it does not destructively interfere with the signal and smear it. Oh, okay. interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a fundamental thing in the construction of the speaker. Yes, it is. Hmm. So there's a whole bunch of little little design things like that that can improve it. So my, mm -hmm. my pyramid speakers I told you about, mm -hmm. the reason I chose a pyramidal structure was I needed a lot of volume for the woofer. So the base was, was pretty big, but as it came up to the top, it came up to a very narrow face where the tweeter was. And the tweeters were offset by three eighths of an inch from the side. Mm -hmm. I used uh, one inch soft dome tweeters because they do a pretty good job with imaging. Um, often you get problems with um, your mid range being interfered with by a lot of acoustic energy from your uh -huh. woofer back feeding into the baffle of the mid range. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I built an enclosure within an enclosure in the pyramids. Uh -huh. The, the mid-range was actually in a PVC enclosure all its own <laughs> where no air pressure energy from the woofer inside the speaker could push into the back of the, of the mid-range. So it's just huh. insulated okay. off from that. Mm -hmm. yeah. That yeah. eliminates yeah. that That's distortion. So now when yeah. you have vocals that that mid-range is trying to reproduce, very clean, natural vocals, and there's no distortion, even mm -hmm. if you've got a drum beat or a guitar that's mm -hmm. going along with it, a whole lot of energy, whatever that low frequency energy is, it's not distorting what the, what the mid range is trying to reproduce. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. So just a lot of little things. You often get what they call um, resonance or standing waves inside of a speaker enclosure. Heard that before, the worst scary. thing you can possibly do is use a cube <laughs> because at one frequency and exactly one frequency, the whole box will be in resonance. Oh. Because every dimension in there is that same distance, right. and you'll create resonance at that frequency. So by having the sloped walls of the enclosure, you are breaking up um, the different distances so the, the whole box can't go into resonance at the mm -hmm. same frequency. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, inside where I braced the walls of the, of the uh, speaker, all the bracing was asymmetric. So if a panel tried to go into resonance, mm -hmm. there was no two panels that were the same size. Mm -hmm. So you would never have two sections of the speaker inside. It was all designed to minimize, <laughs> minimize, minimize. Mm -hmm. Even right, the top right. and bottom of the speakers, if you looked at them, you go, well, this guy doesn't know how to do cabinetry. The top is tilted. <laughs> well, the top and the bottom were both angled. Mm -hmm. So they were not exactly mm -hmm. parallel, same distance from each other. So just all these li just little things, little things, mm -hmm. little things, just a whole page full of little things that you do that are very labor intensive mm. to do in yeah. the design and they're not gonna do it for your typical commercial designs. Right, and they're just pumping quite a lot of design mm -hmm. considerations, yeah. yeah. That, you mentioned going, in, uh, so, if, so if the speaker's in resonance, does that mean that that frequency is essentially not heard, or? Okay, think of yourself uh, singing in the shower. Mm -hmm. You know there's a certain pitch where all of a sudden your voice just amplifies. Yes. Yeah. That's a resonance point oh, inside okay. that shower enclosure. Yeah. Okay. It's the last thing you want to have happen inside your speaker. Right. You don't want it to artificially amplify a particular mm -hmm. frequency because you'll just all of a sudden get this hump mm -hmm. in your response. You really mm -hmm. want you want a bad recording mm. to sound bad and a good recording <laughs> to sound good. Yeah. You want your speakers to reproduce exactly right. what is in that right. recording if you're a purist. Right. Well, course, then that, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, so you probably never use an equalizer then. Yeah. So having <laughs> said that, I was a purist with the pyramids. Yeah. Now with my satellite subwoofer system that I have um, upstairs, I've got an L pad on the back of the, okay. of the bookshelves where I can adjust the levels going to the tweeter because sometimes there are recordings that just were not recorded right. Yeah. And I can go right. It's the other variable. Oh, just, and yeah. I can, I can change it. So bit, yeah, yeah, I've, I, I've compromised. Yeah. <laughs> have you seen uh, a big, has it gone to the positive or negative as digital has become the norm for just reproduction and speakers and all that stuff? Digital has made some good mid-range equipment affordable to a lot more people. Um, as far as like digital amplifiers, for instance. Mm 
um, digital recordings when they came out. I remember when they first came out with CDs, mm -hmm. uh, they had, um, at the time, very uh, crude di di digital to analog um, conversion. Oh, right, right. And so the very first CD players had a little bit of, a, I mean, there's no clicks and pops, no wow and flutter like you had with the turntables, right. <laughs> but there was a little bit of harshness huh. to the sound. And over time, they got better with their digital analog samplers, and they started doing a better and better job of doing the digital conversion. And uh, honestly, you get some phenomenal recordings now. They're just, yeah. they're, they're beautiful. But if you're a purist, <laughs> there's, there's something that is just fundamentally, philosophically um, disturbing mm -hmm. about the fact that you're only taking a sample every certain right. number right. of milliseconds, right. microseconds, and oh, that yeah. you are missing real content. Yeah, I was saying, it is a loss of information, <laughs> regardless of how how right. high you know flack audio file, all that stuff. Like, if there's, it's still sampled. Like you said, so. high end audio file people lay awake at night just fretting about that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I just get a good night's sleep. Yeah, <laughs> they, they take it to some That's funny. Fights. So, uh, did you grow up around here? I did. I'm a native Hoosier. Um, I grew okay. up in Carmel, Indiana, when Carmel was cow pasture oh, oh, in the in the say, 1960s. Yeah, you. if you know Carmel, Indiana now, it, that is not the Carmel <laughs> I grew up in. Oh, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I don't want to slam them, but that's a Snootyville. It really is. That's there's funny. some serious money up there now. And yeah, there certainly is. We were. I mean, there was woods <laughs> behind our house, and uh, we had almost an acre in a what was a somewhat rare suburban neighborhood there there weren't that many it was a lot of farmland oh. so mm -hmm. it has changed dramatically even now when i go up to visit the family it's like i have to kind of think about where i am because there's all these shops and stores and establishments and all that but you have <laughs> some very nice areas up there now mm -hmm. well okay uh going off of your work you said you started in about 1990 with the ffa or the faa yes yes correct um now Something that's been in the news and big here, not just recently, but for a while now. There have been a lot of different topics, and some of them seem, you know, right, right now the, the, the big order of the day is coronavirus. That's the big thing <laughs> yes. that's on everybody's plate. Mm -hmm. But in the, recently, and it's something that's been talked about for quite a while, is climate change. So specifically, I know it doesn't seem like it would quite line up with what you were going to talk about, but it does. I've talked to you about this a little bit before, and you shared some information with it. It was kind of interesting. And I thought it was a unique perspective. Would you mind telling us uh, what your perspective is on all that? Because you, you sure. also lived sure. back in the uh, 70s more when it, when it was the other <laughs> yeah. uh, other version of it? Yes. As I understand. Yes, that is, that is correct. And it's, I was born in 86, so I'm kind of behind on that. <laughs> <laughs> you do get some perspective as you see different, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, crises come and go. Mm -hmm. um, and Yeah, oh, first off, just really generally... Since you've grown up around here, would you say the weather, just as a general question, has changed a lot from when you were a kid to now? Just in a very general sense. A couple of times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we went through, uh, when I was a little kid, I remember there being a lot more snow and then there wasn't for many years. And then it seemed like there was more for a while. And the last few winters we've had here have been real duds, mm -hmm. which is a bummer. Yeah. I actually like the snow. Yeah. yeah. I enjoy snow. Yeah. I don't like it just to be cold. If it's going to get cold, <laughs> I want... I want snow. Right, it'd be worth it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. So as far as the uh, yeah, I don't know where to start climate change, one. yeah, it's hard to know where to start. Let me start <laughs> with this. Um, I'm one that tends to dig a little bit and try to get, yes. get behind the, the story a little bit and find out I, where things I are coming from. That, yeah. <laughs> so when I was working on my physics undergrad, um, there was a, one of my profs um, said that there was a study done um, that claimed that the speed of light had changed over time. It had it used to be faster and it had come down and slowed down and then now was relatively fixed. And I mean, mm. physics has said for decades now that the speed of light is constant. And when you do your physics calculations, you always assume that it's a constant. So that intrigued me. So I started, started digging and we didn't have the internet back then even. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm in the library and just looking around. I finally got to the original study that this guy did on the speed of light. And I thought, here we go. I'm mm -hmm. going to find out what he did and how he tested this. And I delved into the report and I got done with it. And I was like, 
are you kidding me? <laughs> this is the most unscientific thing <laughs> I have ever seen. <laughs> I thought, I wonder if all scientific research is this way. What a tragic yeah. disappointment, you know, because uh, people kind of, people have a tendency to idolize science. Yeah. Very much um, so. And, yeah. and prioritize it. And what I've found, I don't want to be unkind, but what I've found over the years is there's an awful lot of so-called science that is highly political. Mm -hmm. It's motivated by research money. Yeah. Um, and just uh, there is there is intellectual competition between researchers. Mm -hmm. There's just a whole lot of underhanded stuff going on. There mm -hmm. are there are researchers, researchers that have have tricked and supplanted and robbed from others. And mm -hmm. it's just not the pretty picture that you see. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see something trumpeted in the news in the morning, science has proved, mm -hmm. science has discovered, just <laughs> put the brakes on, mm -hmm. slow down and go and do some reading, mm -hmm. look behind yeah. it. And so many times it's kind of like, oh, no, mm -hmm. that's, that's not what that said. And it's disappointing. It really is. I mean, science yeah. has made some amazing progress. I mean, some of the Definitely. discoveries, particularly in medical fields and, and research into chemistry and physics and so many things, biology is amazing. But so many of the all of a sudden breakthrough claims right. when you get down to what they really are. And it, of course, one of them I've got in my mind is the, you know, the, the life on Mars, life on the asteroids, life here, life mm -hmm. there, um, signs of life. And mm -hmm. those are some of the most tragically disappointing claims because if you go and read, just work your way back, mm -hmm. get to the sources, find out what is actually going on, and you're like, that's a lie. <laughs> <laughs> it's just yeah. a lie. And you'll hear yeah. about it, they'll trumpet it, and there it is in the news, and then all of a sudden you don't hear anything more about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It, goes, it goes silent, and that's because there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, it, you know, with a science background, a science and engineering background, um, I mean, my whole career, that's disappointing because that casts um, a negative aspersion on everybody. Right. You know, and because there's some, science is just this broad concept of all the scientists out there in a lot right, of these minds. Yeah. Right. And you've got some really good, solid research and scientists that are doing great work, oh, yeah. and they look bad when mm -hmm. others lie. And mm -hmm. I don't think there's any place where it's more prevalent right now than what started out as global warming. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't call it that anymore. Mm -hmm. There's a reason. <laughs> it's not panning out. Yeah. And uh, I, I could go on and on with the global warming thing. What, what's disappointing to me, people are going to say, oh, you're a, you're a science denier. No, I don't think so. <laughs> You've got a strong background in this. Um, I am not a science denier, nor do I hate the environment and want to see, you know, all of animal life die and, and kill planet Earth. Yeah. What I think is tragic is that the whole focus right now is on carbon. Right. It's right. carbon. It's major. Carbon, that's the major thing, you know. I right. mean, that, that's your, 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 your greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide and it's carbon footprints and carbon, mm -hmm. carbon credits and carbon, I'm carbon, 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 it. carbon. And I'm like, how did you get off on that rabbit trail out there? <laughs> how did you do that? I don't know how you did that because mm -hmm. as, as Christians, we have a biblical imperative of stewardship. Right. Mm. Yes. Starting in Genesis, in Proverbs, of all people on the planet that should be concerned about mm -hmm. taking care of this earth that God has given to us. Christians should be taking care of this earth. That's mm -hmm. an excellent point. And so what do I see? I see people jumping on the climate change bandwagon and screaming about carbon, and they are some of the most tragically waste, wasteful people and mm. thoughtless people. Um, <laughs> oh, I agree. It, it's, it, it's amazing. And I mean, mm. we are absolutely trashing this planet, and nobody seems to care as long as it doesn't have the word carbon in right, it. right, yeah. And Whatever that's uh, that's bad. Yeah. And we've had a lot of things. You remember Al Gore's movie, you know, yeah. The Inconvenient <laughs> Truth. Yeah. And there was a lot of uh, deceitful stuff in that. Hmm. Um, it really was not on the up and up. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of the IPCC, the Inter International Panel on Climate Change. It's a world consortium of yeah. all these scientists. And, and they would publish a lot of things, a lot of kind of alarmist things. Hmm. And years ago, yeah. they, they said that within 100 years, 
sea level was going to rise by 100 feet. Okay, really? and everybody was like, oh. that's pretty drastic. Yeah. Well, it was, and they were they're making all these computer models, and the problem with computer models is, you give me a set of data. You give me a result that you want, I can get a computer program yes. to get you there. There's, I can model it. I can make it happen. So you algorithm. have to have intellectual yeah. honesty when mm -hmm. you make these models. Mm -hmm. um, the IPCC um, eventually could not support that, and they dropped it down and dropped it down, and it was down to 20 feet, and it was down to 10 feet, and then it was down <laughs> to 4 feet, and then it was down to 2 feet. And yeah. people who were the, the climate hystericals mm. pushed back on the IPCC saying, you've <laughs> got to step it back up again because nobody will pay attention uh, if you don't. Enough. And yeah. so they brought, the, they brought the level back up again That's on what the prediction was for political reasons so that people would not say, oh, everything's okay. Right. That's intellectually dishonest. Yeah. yeah. I'm well, uncomfortable with that. Yeah, very much so. <laughs> and as Christians, you're right, we should be. And we should be, yeah. Mm -hmm. when did, wasn't Greta, Greta Thunberg involved with them or something recently here? I'm not sure. Or she spoke to one she's of those been, things. She's had a lot. Yeah, she's. I was up trying to think where things. I'd heard of them recently, but I believe it may have been in relation to her. Yeah. The, the, what's what fascinates me about that is, I'm of course I'm I'm a, a bit of a cynic, so I'm always my question is always uh, where's the money going, and mm -hmm. you know is why I mean I'm the why yeah, person anyways. Benefits. I ask why on everything, but then, you know, like you said. Yeah when things go up and then down and then back and forth and you're like, why? Like, well, who's benefiting from this? Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight or opinions on that? I, I pulled this because I wanted to be able to read this. This is okay. from Investors Business Daily. And they're a pretty neutral organization. You know, they're not a, not a political agenda, but they talk about this. Obviously, climate stuff affects business. Oh, yeah. Clearly. I mean, there's a whole lot of things. One of the big things that, it, that is, is affected is if you're not a green company, Right. People aren't interested in you. Right. So if you do nothing more than put green in your name, you've at least made some yeah. progress. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So making the world a better place. Yeah, yes. We should be green more fighters. So we had Paul Ehrlich from the 1960s, and Paul Ehrlich was uh, was a big uh, conservationist, probably one of the original green people, and he was trying to push hard to do the alarmist thing, hmm. and uh, he said that between 1970 and 1980, that four billion people including 65 million Americans, would perish in the great die-off. Wow. Okay? Um, <laughs> it was a big echo catastrophe, and he said, most of the people who are going to die in the great cataclysm in the history of man have already been born. Hmm. And that was going to be um, 70s and then the 80s, and things weren't panning out. Um, <laughs> I, was like, I don't remember that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the, the problem was, and what he said was, the population growth is outstripping the ability to supply food. And oh, so we were going to have billions of people that were going to starve to death. That was, the, oh, wow. that was his, uh, his basis. He was saying that back in the 60s. He wrote that in 1968. Hmm. Okay. Yes. That's an old story now. <laughs> it is an old story, but not, un not that particular, undeterred. But in, in 2017, um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, he now said that human civilization stands in peril from, going, from an ongoing mass extinction on the Earth because dwindling population sizes and range shrinkages of vertebrates amount to a massive anthropogenic erosion of biodiversity and the, of the ecosystem services essential to civilization. <laughs> so in the 70s, we were going to die from overpopulation and now in 2017, we're going to die from underpopulation. Huh. So here we go, wow. back and forth. And uh, yeah, something I mentioned to you, Mark, um, some weeks back was um, in the 70s. Oh, and, yes. yeah. you know, I was, I was a teenager in the 70s, and I remember the big scare. And I mean, there was mountains of scientific evidence, scientific proof that we were dying of global mm. cooling. Okay. Uh, um, the, the entire universe was cooling off, planet Earth was cooling off, and we were all going to die of what they called heat death. It was for certain. At the time. It was for certain, and science mm -hmm. had proved it, and anybody who didn't believe it was a science denier. Mm -hmm. And then it all kind of lost steam after they realized that actually nothing was happening. <laughs> so, <laughs> wait a couple decades, and here we are with the global warming thing. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, and when people immediately criticize the scientific community, community saying, "Well, you used to say it was global cooling, mm-hmm. and now it's global warming," mm-hmm. they just didn't know as much back then. Right. And now we right. know. Now science knows because science always knows. <laughs> we you just you just trust us because yeah. we know. <laughs> and again, we have a lot of intellectual deceit mm. with the global warming thing. Mm-hmm. And I wish they would get off of the global warming. I wish they get off of climate change. I wish they would get back to what we really kind of had going, I think, halfway decently in the 70s and even in the 80s. And that was pollution. I mean, when we started oh, the EPA, yeah, yeah. it was yeah, all about controlling pollution. Yeah, and it's a bigger I, threat. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen this satellite imagery that they have of, I think it's nitrous, nitrous, oxide, not dioxide, nitrous oxide, I believe, maps, the pollution maps mm-hmm. from satellite uh, over China, it's all uh, cleared. Oh, huh. It's gone. Huh. It's gone? Because of the coronavirus. What? People oh, quit driving, people weren't traveling, oh. all, of the, all of the emissions oh, just wow. and the earth started cleaning itself up in those areas. <laughs> oh man, that's I mean, fast, earth too. has earth has the ability to yeah. recover from these things if you don't overdo it. Right. And so they're seeing the same thing over Italy now. Interesting. They're seeing the, the smog and some of these pollutants that are in the atmosphere just starting to dissolve. Yeah, yeah. you got to look it up. It's well, kind of, yeah. it's I fun to see. That. I wonder if LA that, looks that any is, better. <laughs> that isn't in the headlines. Uh, that, yeah, you don't hear about that. That um, So is there something that we should be concerned about? Is there something that we should be, as a human race or as Christians or as, you know, whatever, that we should be doing differently uh, in, a, in a big way? Yeah, and I think a lot of it is going to be a very slow, <laughs> I don't want to use the term woke. I hate, I, I don't <laughs> want to do that, but there needs to be a slow awakening of what we are doing to our environment. Mm-hmm. You know, the amount mm-hmm. of trash we produce is yeah. phenomenal. Mm-hmm. I mean, go to, go to a fast food restaurant and while you're eating your food, just start, just start watching around you all of the one-time use stuff mm-hmm going into plastic trash bags, and there's some guy during a lunch rush, all he's doing is emptying trash bags, Mm -hmm. just filling dumpsters out there from single-use meals. Mm -hmm. Um, They were all foam Mm -hmm. back in the 80s and 90s. Now they're using paper, which is good. Still goes into landfills, but at least the paper stuff breaks down. Mm -hmm. But there's still so much plastic that we trash. We Mm -hmm. use and trash. Um, I... I go, you know, out to eat with somebody and I see them get like 28 napkins yeah. <laughs> and yeah, use yeah. one. Yep. Uh, I, I use mine. I stick them in my car and blow my nose later. Or something. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to get a napkin, use it. Don't, don't grab 12 napkins and use yeah. one and throw it away. Yeah. Um, uh, simple things, silly things. Yeah. Like I, I'll see somebody brushing their teeth and the first thing they do is turn the, turn the water on full blast. Mm-hmm. Oh, water just water running down brushing. the drain and they open the drawer and they get their toothbrush out and they get their toothpaste out you know and line it all up and they start brushing just running gallons of water yeah. down the drain yeah. why yeah you you walk through the house and every room in the house the lights are turned on mm-hmm. you know i mean just, just everything just waste 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 mm-hmm. waste waste we got to have the newest cell phone all mm-hmm. the time <laughs> and i don't yes, think yes. people have a clue yes. at the energy footprint mm-hmm. of a new cell phone. Mm-hmm. The number of components, the amount of amount of mm-hmm. labor, the mm-hmm. the energy consumption, electricity, and other oh, fuels yeah. and stuff to produce the materials, it's phenomenal. And we just trash and trash well, and trash and trash. All of that for a marginal improvement, if at all. Mm-hmm. I, I work. I've worked in telecom. Yeah. I've worked in cell phones. I cumulatively like six or seven years, and in my adult life, and it's just it's astounding to me. I kept. I would. It was hard for me to sell phones, be, new phones, because I was still holding onto a phone from three or four years prior to that. Mm-hmm. It was hard for me to say, you need to get the new phone when you don't need the new phone. Like, it doesn't right. do anything your old phone doesn't do. Mm-hmm. And it's just, yeah, it's one of those things where it's just a, a whole production and everything. And it's the same thing, just, mm-hmm. you know, prettier packaging on the new one. So let me let me just run in where angels fear to tread. <laughs> this, this one, I, I doubt it has occurred to hardly anybody. And it would mm. not have occurred to me if my wife were not a Purdue certified master gardener, okay? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> Americana. Ma- mm. Imagine your average American neighborhood mm-hmm. in the lawns. Okay. Mm. okay, what is the most unnatural place on earth? It's a chem lawn front yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There is no biodiversity in yeah. a chem lawn front yard. That's very true. That's not 
how nature works. And right. so people fight and fight and fight against what nature is trying to just be. I mean, yeah. you, you walk out the door of our house and walk over to the woods and you don't see a patch of nothing but, uh, but walnut trees. Mm -hmm. And then over here is a patch of raspberry. You see this whole right. interspersing of stuff all growing together and competing and, and all that. So we, to fight this, we throw all kinds of fertilizer on there to make our grass all thick and green. And mm -hmm. then we put more chemicals on there to kill all the stuff we don't mm -hmm. want. Cause mm -hmm. man, we don't want clover. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Why would we want clover <laughs> yeah, in our forbid, yeah. front yard? Right. And then because we've been throwing fertilizer on there, I had a boss one time back in the eighties and he was complaining about having to mow his grass twice a week. Hmm. But he would put $400 of fertilizer on his little suburban lot a year. Yeah. Man. And then you're out there with your, with your fume belching mower, yeah. <laughs> just, just mowing, 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 yeah. mowing. And like, Stop. Yeah. That nature doesn't look like that front yard. Right. right. Why are you mm -hmm. trying to make it look like that? Let's, if, if you claim to be natural and you claim to love the earth and want mm -hmm. to go green, why don't you start mm -hmm. with your own yard? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> Literally your own backyard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, as I say, for a lot of places, you know, they got the HOA to worry about. So that's, that's what they're, they're having to, these oh, the greenest thing in the world, people. HOAs. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, but that is that is interesting because that's one that nobody ever thinks about and you never hear talked about because like you just, just you just said the entire cycle of everything you do within that lawn is all unnatural and it also is all contributing to there's your carbon emissions coming out of your mower that doesn't really need to be run and you know all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's uh, there's some places uh, I, I lived in Colorado for some years and um, been down to New Mexico and it's interesting to see places where people do just the rocks. Instead of yes. a, instead of a yard, and for me, I'm just like I'm kind of lazy, and I'm like that would be nice, just like some mm -hmm. rocks, and not to worry about anything. Never mow, never do all that stuff, mm -hmm. weeding all that. It's just like eh, it well, looks except nice. when time. you put the rocks down, the weeds grow up. Yeah. So the people yeah. That have the rocks. Either they're out there pulling weeds by hand, or spraying. Yeah. Or spraying. Or yeah. spraying. Killing yeah, something. Spraying well, chemicals. Yeah. You see, you lay down a layer before that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of plastic. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no matter how you dice it. Yeah. So I think if we, as Christians, if we took, really took a step back and really looked at everything we do in our culture and started looking at how God designed it to be, I mm -hmm. think we find out we're doing a lot of things wrong, mm -hmm. and, but it's going to be a very slow adjustment because mm -hmm. we have to learn a few things and teach our children and they learn a few more things and you make a very slow sure. walk back to what should be the true green movement where we really love the earth and mm -hmm. are taking care mm -hmm. of things as good stewards mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. this politicized, um, absolutely off the rails, wacko thing that we mm -hmm. have for climate change today. Mm -hmm. That's just, it's nuts. It's not, it's not saving mm -hmm. anything. It's not saving the planet at all. Mm -hmm. right. Another point I was going to make or mention about that, which is a very simple point. I think you brought it up in one of our conversations as well. It might be one that Ken Ham references honestly too. But it's something so simple. Uh, it seems to me, if I'm not mistaken, we don't really have a big sample to examine in order to make calculations and predictions about the future. We <laughs> can only go back so far. Mm -hmm. And we only started recording at a certain time. And even then, not all of that recording is accurate. Mm. But on top of that, we only have from here to here in a space of time that is like, that it's way bigger than I can hold my arms. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I like I said, I don't know if it was you or who was making this point, but we don't know what quote unquote trends really are for the earth. What's normal mm, for the earth, right. what's abnormal, what should be happening, what shouldn't. We're sitting here going, is it cooling? Is it warming? And then we're going nuts about either one. Like mm -hmm. we really, as Christians, we shouldn't be going nuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. we might because be. we don't even have all the information. How can anyone make that call in the begin to begin with? Yeah, mm -hmm. might be looking at just a fraction of a meta cycle that hasn't completed yet, and we don't even know it. Yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have made that point, and it's a very valid point. Um, I it seems so I get I get kind of tickled, I guess annoyed and tickled at the same time <laughs> with some of these articles. I'm I'm call me what you want. I am a diehard young Earth. Biblical Genesis <laughs> creationist, mm -hmm. okay, and I think it is a very defensible position, mm -hmm. and I think it's the truth also. Mm -hmm. And and I know some people just don't don't believe that. I'm friendly right. to everybody, you know. <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna cast shade on you, but I'll just disagree with you. But yeah. um, these articles that I see, like there, there's one I've, I've got, I think I've got it in here. Um, they said 
it was, it was a climate change thing about carbon, and they said, the amount of carbon dioxide in the air, it hasn't been this high since the Precambrian period, you know, mm. 60 million years ago. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I don't remember any SUVs yeah. back in the Precambrian yeah. period. I mean, That's besides the too. fact that I don't believe the Precambrian <laughs> period existed 60 million years ago, because right. the Earth wasn't around, but the is point is, <laughs> they were admitting that carbon dioxide has been this high in the past, right. naturally. Right, of course. And somehow, somehow, we made it through. And yeah. here's the other thing. They, they talk about warming, and I want to talk about some of the weather systems, too, because that's, oh, okay. that's oh, right, a, right. another pet peeve of mine. <laughs> but why do we believe that all of the ice shouldn't melt? That, on, the, on the polar caps and All stuff? of the ice. That's something I've wondered about, is why that is automatically a negative. Yeah, I thought I think the only argument I've seen for that, and once again, this is very uneducated of me, but the the one that I've heard, and probably from some uneducated people as well, is that when it melts, the water levels are all going to rise, and mm -hmm. that's going to be catastrophic for the globe. So apparently, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem mm -hmm. to me like there'd be that much there, but then again, I'm just what do I know? Well, it'd be catastrophic for people living on the coastline who don't move. Yes. Right. I suppose that would be the big thing. But as right? far as the planet itself. The beaches itself, would get a little bit higher. Right. So you're going to have some land mass that's going to disappear. And right now, according to the IPCC, when they were being a, a little bit more honest, um, we were going to have a two foot rise in 100 years. We've got 100 years to move people away from mm -hmm. the lower lying areas. Mm -hmm. Seems like we could do that. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's <laughs> done that, right? Mm -hmm. No. Instead, no. we rebuild all the mm -hmm. areas that yeah. get destroyed along right. the coastal Every regions. Time. Yep. And I'm thinking there's a there's a level of hypocrisy here. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. do really unsmart things like we build in areas that are actually below sea level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think Is New Orleans. Really? I was going to say New Orleans. <laughs> it gets wiped out. So level. what do we do? We rebuild mm -hmm. in the same place. Well, why did we do that? Mm -hmm. If we really said we wanted to spend money and do smart wise things with our money having to do with climate change, we would not have rebuilt there. We would have rebuilt farther mm -hmm. back away right. from there. We're not doing that. So yeah. something else is going on. I think it's poly politics and the money trail. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about actual global warming, global temperatures, because hmm. that one's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because <laughs> I did, it's probably been, probably been 15 years ago when, um, our, our pastor um, at the time asked me to do a little mini series, a little, okay. kind of a creation update seminar mm -hmm. on uh, Wednesday nights. And uh, All right. one of them, I, I did quite a bit of research, um, actually went to NASA's actual data, original mm -hmm. raw oh, data, nice. dug yeah. out and, mm -hmm. and saw what they were doing with all the data. Well, they don't and lie. <laughs> again, again, I was, I was very disappointed because... <laughs> um, you know, it's been it's been trumpeted a lot that there have been emails intercepted about them massaging the data, but they actually are very open that they massaged the data. Mm. Um, they came up with correction factors okay. for the data. Um, they created the famous hockey stick chart um, of showing the sudden rise in, yeah. in temperatures. But that was after not one, not two, but three different levels of massaging the data. Mm. Wow. to correct for factors that weren't right. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, anytime you have to do that level of massaging of the data, you need yeah. to, as a scientist, you got to step back and say, okay, this is bordering on not being very scientific. Are we really <laughs> sure this is yeah. right? We need to take a second look at this and not just keep massaging it. Uh, but science, a lot of times, they decide what they want the conclusion to be mm -hmm. and work towards that. And most of the time you can get there. Yeah. If you decide where you want to get and work hard enough, you will yep. get there. Mm -hmm. And science is supposed to take the facts and go where the facts lead you. Right. And that's right. that's not what happens. And a uh, case in point yeah. here, the historically the satellite data has not done a very good job of showing increases in global temperature. Hmm. Um, it's not really supported the um, the land based measurements very well. Not ever. Well, I mean, it's just they never show the level of warming that okay. the land-based sensors do. Oh, okay. Okay. But the interesting thing is, from the satellite perspective, it captures larger swaths of mm. area where I don't know if you've seen any of the ASOS, AWOS type sensors. Sometimes you'll be going down the highway and you'll see this, this little station along the highway and it's got a little spinning anemometer mm -hmm. and a little weather vane and some other yeah. little doohickeys there Seems and then a little, little antenna and maybe a solar panel. Yeah. Those are weather stations. Mm. 
and they are all over the place. There's thousands of these things all over the country. Mm -hmm. They're at virtually every airport of any size mm -hmm. at all. Um, the, uh, the AWASs are airport weather observing systems. ASASs are airport surface observing systems. They look at microburst phenomena, among mm. other things. Uh, these systems are installed in many, many locations. The problem is they sample just the immediate area around where they are. Right. Okay, they can't, you got a temperature sensor, it measures the temperature right here. Right there. It doesn't measure the temperature even 10 feet away. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I actually went to it, one of my FAA classes I took, they wanted me to get up on some weather systems. They sent me to Oklahoma for a several week class on the AWAS system, mm -hmm. generation three. And uh, during the course of the class, they said, by the way, they said, when you go back to your districts, be aware that a lot of these systems were installed incorrectly. Some of them were installed with the weather, or with the temperature sensors over concrete slabs, over transformers, uh, various things like this. And so yeah. they're, and they said they need to be moved. <laughs> yeah. But nobody had the money to do it. So uh, even if you reported right. it, they didn't move it. Well, guess what? Those temperature sensors all read warmer than normal. In some cases where they put the systems, they later built buildings that had exhaust vents too close to these, putting out slightly warmer air. So you got just numbers of systems all over the country of the yeah. ground-based systems that are reading skewed. too warm, yeah. they're skewed. And if you went 50 feet away, you would get a different temperature reading, mm. and that would be closer to what the average for that area is. Right. Furthermore, you don't see these things out on the side of a mountain. They've gotta be in accessible locations. Mm. Mm -hmm. So they put them right along yeah. highways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't know if any of you do motorcycling, but mm -hmm. uh, in, in weather like we've got now, where it's like, you know, 40s in the morning, <laughs> I bundle up in my motorcycle gear and I head down the county road, and man, it's, it's cold and I can hardly wait to get to the interstate. Why? This is about five degrees warmer mm -hmm. on the interstate. I mean, you can huh. tell the difference. If you're on yeah. a motorcycle, it's yeah. very clear, the yeah. temperature difference. They really? put these weather systems right along the interstates. You got all these hot engines going by yeah. and it just slight wow. increase in temperature. So we don't have this good agreement of the land-based measuring systems compared mm -hmm. to the satellite systems. Right. And honestly, right. the best I can tell, the satellite's the more accurate. Mm -hmm. Really? After all that, you'd say it's probably more, that would make <laughs> more accurate. Yeah. And it does not show the hockey stick <laughs> wow. of increase in temperature. Wow. Furthermore, it appears that what we are seeing, what we have been seeing with our weather changes is driven by the solar cycle. Mm. You know, the sun is on a multi-year cycle as a ham radio operator. Right. I, I kind of okay. stay up on that yeah. because your shortwave <laughs> communications, when you get into a lot of sunspot activity, you know, yeah. the, the shortwave bands open up and it's a great day, huh. okay? Um, but when you get to solar minimums, it does affect your weather cycle and the opposite. And what people aren't talking about at all, at all, is the fact that the weather changes we're seeing with the global warming is also happening on Mars. Hmm. Really? Yes. Hmm. They are de de detecting climate change there also. Hmm. They don't talk about that. And of course, because of all the SUVs on Mars, you know, yeah. Mars <laughs> Rover. Um, oh, right, right. <laughs> So yeah, that's, this is a little bit of a hobby horse. Now I'm probably a little, huh. a little animated here, but <laughs> the, the level of dishonesty concerns me. Yeah, you know, I with would my, say so, my science yeah. and engineering background, I, I have a disdain for the dishonesty there. Yeah. Am I saying climate doesn't change? No, climate changes all the time. Mm -hmm. Deserts, yeah. deserts, uh, you know, change, and some areas that are nice, lush areas start drying. Mm -hmm. I mean things change. Mm -hmm. yeah. The problem is in the dishonesty. They talk right. about sea level rise because islands are disappearing. Mm -hmm. um, after the Fukushima disaster, you remember that one in, in Japan, we had the tidal wave that came in, hit the nuclear reactors, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and all that. Oh, yes. Well, tectonic activity. And I remember reading an article talking about sea level rise and they used the southern tip of Japan as proof positive that sea level rise was happening. The problem is the tectonic activity actually lowered that end of the island. Mm. They now have, oh, during wow. tides, they have water coming up into a street hmm. on there because <laughs> it was almost at sea level. That's the kind of intellectual dishonesty that we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And so do you think people are really going to get on board with this mm. if you're not being honest? Yeah. So what yeah. they have to do is they have to play the, the deception game. And I wanna give you the rest of the quote from this, uh, this article in an Investor's Business Daily, 
because it just kind of, it states better than I could. <laughs> the failure to enforce rigorous scientific standards and publicly denounce alarmists and charlatans has left many Americans feeling hoodwinked, <laughs> disregarding all environmental research, which is a shame. But truth and accuracy don't seem to matter to many environmentalists. The late Stanford University climatologist Stephen Schneider told Discover Magazine in 1989, we have to offer up scary scenarios, make simplified, dramatic statements, mm. and make little mention of any doubts we might have. Mm. Each of us has to decide what the right balance is between being effective and being honest. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. That was right out of the mouth of a climat uh, climatologist. You yeah. just said yeah. that. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty scary. incredible right there. Yes. It's, it's an agenda. It's political. Yeah. And it has, it has caused Americans to go, as I said, off the rails with carbon mm. when that's not the real issue. In fact, um, you tell me, what is the predominant greenhouse gas on Earth? See, and I'm... <laughs> I would have had to have said probably carbon. You would have to say carbon heard, dioxide, right? It's the only yeah. one I've heard so But much. it's not. Huh. It's not. The primary car uh, greenhouse gas is water vapor. Oh. Water vapor. Oh. And, that makes and sense. Depend, depending <laughs> yeah. on weather phenomenon, water vapor can be anywhere from 66 to 95% of the greenhouse wow. gases. Wow. Carbon dioxide falls yeah. way short of that. Yeah. Um, methane, although it is less... Um, well, there's a lot less methane than there is carbon dioxide. It's a much more potent greenhouse gas, mm. which is interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's why some people want to get rid of all the cows. Right, right. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying, time out. We're supposed to be good stewards. Right. We're not supposed to get rid of the cows. We're not supposed to get rid of the steak burgers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If anything, yeah. we need better meat. Yeah. Well, and that, and that goes, speaks to an interesting uh, thing as well, because, again, for me, the why... On a lot of those things, there there seems to be a connect the dots between some of these concepts of, uh, I'll, I'll just say you know on, especially on the left side of the aisle politically, um, between some of these things as far as uh, climate change, um, environmentalism, pollution, um, s s veganism, there seems to be a lot of interconnectedness between a lot of these things and. From the, crossover, yeah. from the outside, it, there's almost a religiosity to it. Yes. Uh, and there's not really any other way to frame it when you look at things like, uh, phrases like that, where, where someone's saying, it doesn't matter if this is true, this is what needs to be said. This is what people need to hear. Because that sounds like something you'd hear coming from a dictator who wants to convince his people to do something that, mm -hmm. you know, is completely wrong. Like, that's the kind of mindset. And it's, I have a hard time justifying it from any place other than some kind of religiosity. Um, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Well, you are getting down to the brass tacks of human nature. Mm. <laughs> um, the human psyche needs a cause. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is in our nature that yeah. we need a cause. Bigger than us. We want to yeah. band together, get on the proverbial bandwagon, and have a cause. And people who are shrewd leaders realize that, mm. and they yeah. tap into that. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. if you have a political agenda. Create a cause, get people drummed up on that cause, right mm -hmm. or wrong. I mean, I'm, there are shrewd people who do very good things by drumming up good sentiment and get great things done. Mm -hmm. But the opposite is also true. Yeah. You can take yeah. somebody who, is, who does not have the people's best interest in mind. He's got political motivations, yeah. financial gain motivations, whatever, mm -hmm. and he can manipulate a group of people under the banner of a cause mm -hmm. to do things that furthers his agenda with a bunch of people that aren't being given the facts. Mm. The facts mm -hmm. are being hidden from that and only certain things are given to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, and an, uh, it's another totally simple point, but growing up, I was under the impression, especially as a younger adult and everything, I just was under the impression that the media, not that they never lied, but that in general, there was sort of some sort of legal obligation or something mm. like that, that, mm -hmm. that. Or how about a moral obligation? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. I thought yeah. there for sure was that. And only those people must go into the media. But on top of that, I thought yeah. for sure there's some kind of law or something governing what they can say, how they can say it. And then that was keeping them in line as to what they said. So mm -hmm. 
More or less, I figured they may taint stuff, but how can you really taint the news? Because one plus one is still two. Mm -hmm. But they may not be reporting on one plus one. They're mm -hmm. reporting on something. I, we've mm -hmm. all found out here recently. There are glaringly obvious. There's glaringly obvious evidence of multiple, many of the leading media, you know, associations and everything that are just lying to the people, pretty much, mm -hmm. or misdirection mm -hmm. or something like mm -hmm. that. Uh, with that realization comes the realization that, of course. Not only are the scientists and people like that who are highly motivated about political things watching some of this, some of them, they're also, why, if the media is able to lie, then why wouldn't scientists be able to lie? Science mm -hmm. is not, once again, it's not the all-knowing truth or anything. Mm -hmm. it's, there's, it's not been completely 100% proven. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and some of that, too, because uh, you're talking about them lying, and many times it's not a lie, it's selective yeah. truth. Selective it's what you were talking about earlier. Or There's only 5% of, a... of the greenhouse gases are contained in those certain things. But if that's all you ever talk about, that's 100% of the coverage. That's yes. all anybody's going to think about. That's yep. all anybody's yeah. going to know. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the big issue. But it, the, the whole facts versus It's feelings. boring to talk about, you know, 95% of water vapor in the air. Like, that's not, you know, that's not yeah. a headline. There's no to be crisis, fair, sometimes so, as yeah. low as 66%. Oh, okay. But, but sometimes oh. 95%. <laughs> We're saved. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you're, you're saved. It's okay. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a variable. It changes based mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. atmospheric conditions. Mm -hmm. So, Tiny home in Colorado, yeah, those are kind of that's big. A major and it's fillers. hilarious because yes. all the rich people who live up in the, you know, the, um, the ski lodges and stuff, the skiing areas, they then will build their tiny home as like their summer place somewhere else or whatever. And it's, you know, environmentally eco-friendly and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, mm -hmm. so it's basically just like a small house. And you're like, yes. That you're putting way too much money in just yeah. to make it small. You're mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of people who live in a tiny home because that's all they can afford is a tiny home. Like, yeah. it's just hilarious Ooh. that that's you know hip and in you know to, yeah. to make this tiny I, little. Yeah, I, I recently thing. watched a, a thing about a, a, okay. a documentary about people who were in a tiny home in Colorado. I think it was or something. Two people. They they raised. They had a Kickstarter where they raised money to make this tiny home and to make hmm. to buy cameras and other stuff. The boyfriend was big into it. It was just a couple, I guess, but they weren't married. And they went and built this tiny home, bought the property, did everything. He spent about a year making it. They lived in it for six months, split up, went mm. their separate ways, and they both had houses the entire, or they both were in at least another house the entire time. <laughs> so in reality, they did all this work and put all this energy and everything into making that, only to not use it. Now I think he was selling it or something. So, was, but they, they, the, the whole point was they made a documentary about tiny homes and living yeah. in tiny homes, and that's what they made their money on. They actually huh. made a bunch of money off this documentary. They sold it. They're, it's still selling on like Amazon Prime or something. Oh wow! But these people are total fakers. Yeah. They're yeah. not doing any of that. Yeah. Say it was a movie set. <laughs> like they just there, built. there is a lot of hypocrisy in the green movement. Hmm. Tons of it. It's hmm. amazing. It's now, one, one of the favorite ones is all they of these all talk. these rich people, you know, the beautiful people, the Hollywood types, yeah. flying all over the place to conferences on, right. on climate. Right, <laughs> and right. Private jets, you know, yeah, and all I that. They don't care. Yeah. Uh, who was it? One of the, I think it was Bernie was getting like off, I can a name plane off a few of them already. Like trying to hide, you know, <clears> because he had flown in a plane first class or whatever, or, or a private chartered flight, you know, because they talk about this stuff all the time and then you see them doing that and it's like all of it does it yeah. really matter then i mean is it really important to you or is that excusable because it's you you know are you above it is it just for it's us just, like, yeah yeah well it's an they, interesting the, thought. the old saying is laws are for the little people mm. Mm -hmm. to keep them under control <laughs> yeah yeah they don't they'll go too far down that because i'm, I'm a big conspiracy <laughs> nut so uh <laughs> you can get into some crazy okay, let's, there. Okay, let's talk about Hillary Clinton. Okay, I used to oh. work civil service Navy and uh -huh. dealt with classified stuff. And I can tell you right now, if I did what she did in handling that classified material, I would be in Leavenworth. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, they would, they yeah. would put me in there and right. throw the key away. Right. Mm -hmm. She is powerful. She's rich. That's yeah. why she's untouchable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No she's got that. a lot of connections. Uh, yeah, the Clintons in general. There's a there's a lot. That's a big can of worms. We may have to make a whole another. <laughs> that just is a one big can of worms. Speaking of yeah. documentaries. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's a big can of and worms. now week twelve of the. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that's always interesting when someone does a self funded or self promoted documentary about their themselves and how, you know, the things they've done for the world and whatever. 
that again, I'm a cynic, so immediately I'm like, yeah, you're sweeping something under the rug. You're just, you know, it's it's just a puff promo piece on yourself. I don't know it's hard for me to trust anyone who does stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of hit home with us. Uh, you were saying as Christians and stuff, we should be responsible with all this. Well, it, even just e- even not as Christians, um, in some ways, it, it behooves people to just be good with your. Uh, you were talking about the, all the waste, the plastic, all that other stuff. In mm-hmm. many ways, we waste energy. Mm-hmm. And there's yes. a lot of potential energy that could be tapped into. We were talking about here recently, up in Portland, which is a terrible area. <laughs> but up in Portland, they, they do put in, they do do a few things that are a little bit, a uh, little progressive, but maybe it's it's a good direction to go for energy-wise. They had this idea. They put in turbines, basically, in their big sewer pipes. And, well, it, in the inlet pipe for the water for the city that comes in, because it's mm-hmm. huge, and that's just an untapped resource there because you could, they made these low flow or they, they don't um, they don't resist too much on the flow of the yeah, current of the water going through. Yeah. But it's low resistance. There's these fins. They turn. And with, like, so many of those turbines, they're like uh, – they, they put in a section that had four of those in it. And they go, this could power up to 150 homes. Well, I was going to say proposed. I don't know that's that they proposed. actually implemented that. We don't know if that's the average mm-hmm. or what. But it, the, the, the point being the technology is there. For right. that to be used. Right. Mm-hmm. It's not being used. And I, I'm pretty sure it's not being used in India. I don't know. I'll have to check on that. Yeah. But on the way in and on the way out, that's untapped resource that could be going to it. Because electricity is probably our biggest bill. Recently, for the, the reason it's hit home for us is because recently here we started having to pay our bills a, little, a bit more. I know uh, no, normally we were paying them in a different way. We kind of had a thing worked out with our landlord. We, we were doing jobs and work for him to help him out. And, he, and then he would pay the bills. And we were trying not to take too much advantage of all that. But it so happened after a certain time during winter, it slowed down a whole bunch. He had no work. And eventually, we it just it's only fair. We started having to pay the bills and help out with that. But as we're doing that, we're trying to cut back as much as possible because, you know, we're not rich. <laughs> and we're trying to just cut out mm-hmm. as much as possible. We're, we're no, we don't care exactly how our house looks if it's going to be really efficient. <laughs> so we're we're ready to do extreme stuff there. And we're looking into all kinds of different things. We've been talking about, oh, man, uh, in the city, I know there's kind of... There are regulations to places like California, but we're talking about everything from rain barrels to we we distill all of our water because we don't like the tap water from the city as much. Uh, we just like to be clean and safe. So we distill all of our water, uh, try to do that in volume. Drinking water. Drinking mm-hmm. water. Water is another big one, though. It's, a, it's not huge, but a tankless water heater, it's not heating 24 seven, but there's so many ideas like that, that now we're being forced to look into and we're being almost mm-hmm. forced to be responsible because suddenly we're paying for it all. So yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a, a strong motivator. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very recently I've suddenly been really, really becoming knowledgeable on a lot of this stuff, <laughs> looking it up as much as possible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which it's gotta be nice out here. Um, as well, one as Christians, I think the natural way is usually the better way to do things if possible. Uh, if there is a more natural versus, you know, man-made stuff. But then again, God did make us to solve problems too. Mm-hmm. It must be nice out here though. I was going to say, uh, what do you find as the pros and cons? Because you're kind of out here in the middle of, not the middle of nowhere, but it's farmland. You're not surrounded by, you said you're on your own independent system as far as septic, mm-hmm. water, you have a well. Mm-hmm. Um, what are the pros and cons of living out here versus like, say, us in the city, directly in the city? <laughs> mm-hmm. I'll tell you what the main one is, which will surprise you. Lack of access to high-speed internet. Oh, really? Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is it pretty hard out here? Um, actually, yeah. the only thing we can get right in this, we've got a strange little bubble right here, <laughs> and we're very close to the interstate, but there's yeah. a strange yeah. little bubble not far. where there's no there's no cable service, yeah. no high-speed internet service providers. So the only thing we can do is we've got our, we've got our little tiny Sprint box. It's a mm. cell-based thing. Oh, wow. So whatever room you want internet in, you carry your little box yeah. in there. Yeah. Or we huh. use, or we use the data package on our phones. Yeah, and uh, so that's a that's a downside of rural living. Yes, but I'll yeah. tell you what, I just I love waking up in the morning, particularly in the spring and summer, and you can look out north, south, east, west out these windows, and I mean crops growing, mm-hmm. woods, yeah. deer. You've mm-hmm. got a garden going. I just and all that. got the garden going, and uh, we just love it. Yeah, and we grow yeah. vegetables, and we got got an orchard, and it's just. It's fantastic, and unfortunately, we have to share 
our raspberries with the dog. We had to share our, <laughs> our pears with the wolves and, uh, oh, really? and, and, and uh, wow. coyotes and all That's these funny. animals that like to eat the pears. I and didn't know they ate fruit. That's funny. It, it's weird. The coyotes come and they eat pears and then they <laughs> love just defecating on the driveway. And I just, uh, nice. and oh, wow. of course, you're not going to train them to, yeah, right, <laughs> to do anything right. different. The Those deer will go and lay, lay down on the corn and just lay big swaths of corn down. That's fine. But uh, <laughs> that's part of sharing the ecosystem. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. There is something very different, though, of looking out the window and seeing green versus looking out the window and seeing the bricks of the house next door. Yes. Like, it's it's yeah. it's a psychological thing, and, and it affects you on multiple levels. It creates a mentality that all is man-made. Hmm. So people that live in the city, it was very telling recently that a, um, a journalist was mm-hmm. making the comment about people that lived out in the rural areas. Mm-hmm. Well they made their choices and that's why they're stuck in the rural areas. Hmm. They should really? move they should move to the city. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking to myself, whoa, whoa, who's the <laughs> narrow minded person here? Yeah. If he doesn't yeah. understand the concept that the cities are artificial, yeah. And that everything the city uses comes from industrial and or rural areas. Yeah. Yes. I mean that but that's what happens when you when you grow up in just a city and that's all you know and mm-hmm. you haven't experienced other parts of the world, mm-hmm. you develop this mentality that the yeah. city is is what there is and that man is responsible for everything and mm-hmm. and you don't see yeah. God in the city. Right. It's very true. Right. You get that kind of tunnel vision. We were talking yeah. about this a little bit the other day as uh, I've grown up as missionary kids to a great extent down there in South America. It, you know, a lot of people in the U.S. particularly would benefit from taking a trip outside the country, even yeah. if you're just going to Mexico yes. or ca- even yeah. Canada, yes. uh, just somewhere else, because you'll see that it's not the same everywhere. And mm-hmm. we are actually Absolutely. quite privileged in the United States. We have yes. it so good here. Magnificently. Everyone likes to go on about how bad it is until they go out and look at the rest of the, 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 rest of the world. If you look <laughs> at the rest of the world, we're sitting on the top of the mountain, like yeah. we're at the very pinnacle. Yeah, we're doing the best. We we have it so good here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We, we have our problems because nowhere is perfect. Oh yeah, but ironically, mm-hmm. the one that was founded on biblical on on godly uh, principles and all mm-hmm. that that the founders were all very, they were firm believers. Mm-hmm. Many mm-hmm. of them and everything. I mean, it was founded kind of with that in mind. Mm-hmm. Not not written in, but you know. Well, and some of it. I mean, but this experiment yeah. has lasted the longest. It's done the best. <laughs> yeah. I don't yeah, think I don't uh, think enough people are aware of that nowadays because a lot of people yeah. I, I you know I I don't go on Facebook very much, but when I do I see a lot of complaining. Yeah, and it always astounds me. I'm like, uh, you didn't wake up next to it. You didn't wake up in Venezuela having to dig through a trash can for your breakfast if right. you found one. You know, right. or if you found some. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I remember well, one time we had a uh, a couple that was visiting our church, and the uh, the young man had grown up in Indianapolis, and he had never been, this is what he told me, he had never been outside of Marion County mm-hmm. in wow. his life. Mm-hmm. Not even the county. Ever. Not, never been out of the county. Kind of blew my mind. <laughs> That's and incredible. I thought, I thought, well, you know, I was a little dubious about his claim, but we invited <laughs> the couple over for lunch to our place here out in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they hopped in our vehicle, and we were driving out here. We're coming up 400 west. And he's just staring out the window and staring. And he finally said to me, he says, is that corn? And I thought, wow. I said, no, I said, that, that's soybeans there. I said, the corn is usually about eight feet tall around here, the species that we, mm. oh, okay. Never seen hmm. a crop growing <laughs> ever yeah. wow. in his life. Yeah. And so that kind of that kind of thinking that that changes how you think and yes. how you perceive the world. If you don't have the breadth of experiences, yes. and I'm sure there's a lot of things I would think about differently if I saw more of the world. Sure. But I work sure. at it, and yeah. uh, and I I'm privileged enough to be able to do it, and I recognize mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Some people are not privileged enough to do that, but mm-hmm. I'm glad that day we were able to give that guy broader experience. Sure. Yeah, he yeah. learned some stuff and he was like, oh, he knew more about the world and we <laughs> yeah. all need to do that. Yeah. We need yeah. to learn. Yeah. God left a lot of stuff for for us to explore. That was, that was the next thing I was <laughs> going to say. Yeah. God, uh, it, it, we've been discussing this recently too. He left, I think it, it points in the Bible and all of his creation. I feel like God made mysteries for man to uncover. He made the earth for us to discover and have dominion over and all that. He like, he, he made it for us to mm-hmm. the greatest extent. Mm-hmm. And that, to that end, 
as Christians, there should be Christian scientists who, who are going out there who are trying to figure out those mysteries, mm -hmm. trying to see the science like that God made and put in motion, the things he set in motion, mm -hmm. that microscopic geometry that's in everything. You know, that's not by chance. That couldn't possibly be by, be by <laughs> chance. You've got to be a, well, okay. You have to be rather uneducated or just not, I, I don't know. I would believe it's the wrong conclusion to say that that happened by chance. <laughs> mm. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I, I think God left a lot of that stuff there for us to discover and to use, and he, he wants us to do that. Right. So why not go and do that and find out about electromagnetism and how to make other, other ways to make sound? And uh, I mean, that's another thing. We're largely built on vibrations. We're built on sound. We're, uh, as humans, we're built to interact with sound in many, mm -hmm. many different ways. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, it, and it's there. It's present so many times in the Bible, before the Earth's creation, after the Earth's creation. In uh, pivotal moments, the angels are singing. There's a lot of that. And... Even the, earth, the, the very Earth's creation itself, God spoke it into creation. I mean, he may have done extra stuff in addition to that, but I, it doesn't exactly say, but it definitely says he spoke the words. Mm -hmm. All this leads back to vibration. Da, da, da. It, it makes me, as a Christian, it inspires me to go want to explore that stuff mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. and figure Absolutely. out how it works and right. what did God leave for us to find and what, what have we not found yet? Right. What have we not tapped into? Yeah, Why can't I lot. fly yet? You know, I mean, I, I, I kind of want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Well, and, and it's funny too, you were mentioning earlier um, the search for, um, for life on other planets and all of that. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I don't know if you, if you heard, but um, uh, SETI, that the, they monitor the um, transmissions or you know, lack of transmissions. Mm -hmm. They just decided to shut down the actual monitoring of all the transmissions and just go back to analyzing the data they've collected over the past however many years because they never got anything in, but mm -hmm. they're going to go back over their data and see if they can find something. But what that what bothered me about that is like what you mentioned earlier is the possibility of them massaging the data or saying, well, we think this might be something when, you know, there may be nothing there. They've just been listening to, you know, empty space this whole time. Um, but, the, but that's not to say that there isn't things to explore and there isn't things to dive into and, and to dig deeper into and, and, um, yeah, like you said, I think that's part of why God gave us such a such a strong, curious drive to want to do yeah. things and to want to learn about things. And, Curiosity is definitely and part of it. Yeah, fascinating amount of stuff out in space, mm. and mm -hmm. I think we are supposed to explore it mm. and learn from it. I mean, it's just I agree. The, you, multiple lifetimes can be spent exploring space and all that's out there, and I I feel sometimes like it's a real shame that the federal government has spent so much money on the SETI program. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they've even tried to, it, this was kind of one of the original crowdsourcing things. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar mm -hmm. with it, but back in the day, and I think probably even up to recently, you could download a uh, program on your computer mm -hmm. and become part of the network of oh, computers yeah. analyzing right. the That's SETI right. data. Yeah. Right. And I never participated in that because <laughs> it just seemed like a waste right. to me. We have so much we can explore out there, but they're they're all focused on finding extraterrestrial intelligence. Right. Uh, you know, I personally, I don't think it's out there. Mm -hmm. My thing is, let's explore what we do see, and yeah. if there's some extraterrestrial, let them come and find us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if they're that intelligent, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, there's plenty of stones still unturned on this planet. I, I feel um, there's there's places in the oceans that we still have not actually been to yet there's species in the amazon and in the congo and places like that they still daily are naming and discovering yes. new things yes and uh it, it, or even there's old no things. yeah yeah or things that yeah have been forgotten and then they're we're rediscovering came so. up from the depths <laughs> yeah no. i don't know if you've picked up recently in the last um i would say the last year they're starting to find a lot of um skeletons or more complete specimens of um, species that are basically the modern versions that we have now, but they're massive. Hmm. They're hmm. huge. For instance, uh, just a few weeks ago, and it's another thing I printed up here, mm -hmm. um, a turtle. Mm -hmm. And we think of the, of the giant turtles that we mm -hmm. see, you know, um, Gal Galapagos turtles mm -hmm. and some of those big enough mm -hmm. to ride on. Yeah, yeah they get big. Well, they have unearthed one that was eight feet in diameter. Wow. Oh, wow. Yes, and we're seeing, they're digging up more and more of these really, really large mm. versions of these animals from yesteryear, mm -hmm. and it's kind of creating some, some a lot of questions <laughs> in the evolutionary community. Mm. It's, yeah, it's upending what they think should be. 
Mm-hmm. And of course, from my perspective, for good reason. You know, if we start on the <laughs> down the evolutionary uh, yeah. trail here, uh, it's another another uh, passion of mine. And I have lots of good discussions with people who are evolutionists. We, we we have great discussions. What I find is they're never able to answer um, the ultimate question. They always want to pull Big Bang, and I always tease them. I say, Yeah, I believe in the Big Bang too. God said it, and bang, it happened. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, the one thing they can't answer in their Big Bang is, I ask them, what was the Big Bang? And they say, it was an explosion. I said, was it an explosion? And they start describing it in terms of natural forces. Yeah. Where did those laws come from right, yeah. that define what an explosion is? And they're just slack-jawed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also asked them about the three-dimensional construct in which this explosion happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that would be pretty space, right? The actual fabric of space itself, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where did that come from? Yeah. Why is it Mm three-dimensional? Why not four? Why are there dimensions at all? So many unanswered questions that they can't come to. I have a a cousin. I I dearly love him. He's older than me, but we had a discussion years ago. And uh, I did my normal thing, kind of walked him back and the whole thing. And eventually he said, well, it all started Mm -hmm. with a hydrogen gas cloud out there. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I said, well, Tom, I said, Tell me, and this this is a sharp guy. I mean, he's a political science professor and just super sharp guy, mm-hmm. you know, and and pretty honest too. I said, so Tom, you're saying that this hydrogen gas cloud just always existed out there? Mm. He said, yeah, just always existed. I said, <laughs> I said, is that really intellectually satisfying to you? Mm. And he kind of hung in his head and he said, no. Yeah, hmm. that's got to be a sad position to be in in some ways. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not saying that to look down on the guy or anything. I'm not saying I'm better than anyone. But if I really had, if I really thought that and really thought that there was no way, no explaining where I thought the earth came from, why would I be sure of anything? Why would anything mm-hmm. matter at that point? Mm-hmm. And, and as Christians, you know, it is not a matter of pride because we believe that God is there right. and God created us and we are absolutely subservient to him right. and accountable to him and we're going to have to give an answer for everything. Mm-hmm. There's no pride yeah. in that. I mean, <laughs> right. to, no. to believe in God, to be a Christian is actually a humbling thing. Mm-hmm. It Very better be. So. I mean, yeah. if you're a proud Christian, there, there's a problem. Right. Yeah. That's <laughs> one of the biggest sins mentioned all throughout the Bible. <laughs> yes. Another yeah. rabbit hole we could go down. Yeah, yeah. That's one of my wife's passions. <laughs> just, people say these certain sins are so bad. She says, the Bible talks more about pride yeah. than anything. Yeah. You know, in the book of Proverbs, it starts out, these yeah. six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination, a proud look. Mm-hmm. How did that make the top of the list? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. True. Very true. <laughs> oh, man. We may have to have a part two to this interview at some point here because yeah. there are... There are some other stuff, conspiracy-wise and other things that we, <laughs> like I said, big cans of worms that we could get into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anything else you wanted to add or say? Been fun. I've enjoyed it. Awesome. Oh, good, good. Oh, thank you. Just, uh, I don't often get to just, just yak uninhibited. So <laughs> that's that's what we want for the yeah, format of this thing. Yeah, that's that's what we're looking for. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope that, you know, I can't tell everybody what what's right, but I hope that the conversation itself stimulates other people to think. Oh, that exactly. would be my goal. Always, right. as, as a teacher at heart, I'm always wanting people to think, mm. and to think for themselves. If, I can, mm. if this is a format that makes people go, wow, I need to think about that. Right. Or awesome. Maybe, yeah, we'll right. look <laughs> that up, right? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for being yes. with us today. We really appreciate you uh, interviewing with us, and we've, we've had a pretty good discussion here, I would say. Yeah. It's been stimulating Absolutely. Well, we yeah, covered yeah. a lot of ground, and it was <laughs> yeah, fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, we got to do this again sometime. Yeah, thank you for you. You have a lovely home, by the way. (laughs) Well, thank you. We we love it out here. A lot of sweat and blood went into building it. I I enjoyed it. That was one of our. Oh yes. How long did that take to build the home? (sighs) I had a general contractor, but we did our own architectural work. Did all of the carpentry. Did all the wood flooring and cabinetry. Handmade all the trim. My wife very (laughs) very patient because mm. we moved in and it took me an additional five years wow. to make all of the trim. Yeah. I had made trim for a room before, you know, mm-hmm. I'd mill it out on the table saw and, you know, with molding heads and stuff. I had done that mm-hmm. for a single room. I just didn't really have a grasp on how much trim there was in a house this <laughs> oh, size. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you go up to the upstairs hallway there and it doesn't look like a big space, but the problem is there's five doors. 
Uh, and each door around. has two sides to it, and yes. both of those sides need trim. Yep. <laughs> there are so many feet of trim, and that little mm. eight, mm -hmm. ten foot section of hallway, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a lot. Yeah. It's a lot that goes It, it makes you mm -hmm. appreciate things so much more when you've had gotten your hands dirty on something like that. Yeah, or stitches in your thumb. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because then when you see it, or someone else says, yeah, I built that, you'd be like, well, good yes. for you. Like that's, mm -hmm. that was something, you know. Like I don't I'm, know if I'm I would hardly be up for a that. master craftsman. I learned my woodworking from my father-in-law. Yeah, my dad taught me how to work on cars and appliances. Mm. My father-in-law taught me woodworking, and cool. uh, he's. Uh, he, I wouldn't say he was a patient teacher, but he persisted <laughs> with me. And uh, the, the famous joke from the family was he would be trying to show me something, and he would he would demonstrate, and he would have me do it and watch me struggle with it, and then he would say. Let me see that once. He just couldn't handle it anymore. He would take the tool oh. back and finish the job. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Oh, that, that is funny. Well, uh, I could not think of a better place than that to end it. Could you? Yeah. No, that's great. Well, Thank thanks. Appreciate it. It's been fun. <laughs>